Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Aquarium Online Academy. My name is Sarah. I'm part of the education department here at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. And today we're going to talk about habitats, but we're going to talk about a, a specific habitat, the tide pool. Now, tide pools are some of my favorite habitats because we have them right here along our coast. So they're a local habitat that we can go explore. But we're going to talk about what this means to be a habitat, what a tide pool is, and then we're going to explore some of the animals that live in that habitat. Now, if you find that you have questions during this program, you can text in right here. The number is 562-286-1838. And you can text in your questions. I have Cynthia here in the studio and she's gonna be taking your questions. And then I have Dana here, she's waving to everyone. And she's gonna be helping take care of all the pictures and images and videos we're gonna see behind me as we explore this habitat. So go ahead and text in your questions or observations or thoughts you have while we go through the program. Now, please keep in mind that text and data rates do apply. And if you're one of our younger viewers, make sure you have adult permission before you text in. Now, if you're watching this program when we're no longer live, so later today or another day, and you find you have questions, you can email us those questions. The email address is right below our phone number right here. At, it's live at lbaop.org. So you can email us those questions if we're no longer live. All right, let's get started. So we are going to talk about tide pool habitats. Now this word habitat, we talk about habitats a lot here at the aquarium. And a habitat is basically a fancy word for a home. It's where an animal lives. Now there are lots and lots of habitats in the ocean. So the ocean itself can be considered a habitat, right? It's where our animals live. But if we were to go dive into the ocean, and take a look around, we'd notice that all the animals in the ocean don't live in the same place. Some animals need a lot of space to move around, like whales and big sharks, they need the open ocean. And there are some animals that are really small and it probably wouldn't be very safe for them if they were to live in the open ocean. So they live in different areas of the ocean. Now the tide pool is, one of the, ha is the habitat that we are going to focus on today. And we're gonna bring up an image of a tide pool. Dana's gonna bring that up for us in just a second and we're gonna take a look at what it looks like. All right, so I'm gonna step off screen and I want you to take a look at this habitat and think about what makes this habitat special? What makes it different from all the other habitats that we might see in the ocean? So let's take a look. So what are some of the things that you notice about this habitat? Any thoughts? What do you notice? One of the things I notice is there's a lot of rocks. So that's one of the key components for a tide pool is we need a rocky habit, a rocky surface. So tide pools are along the shore where there's a lot of rocks. And then what happens is the tide. Now, what is the tide? Let's think about that for a moment. Have we heard that word before? Not as far as laundry detergent tide, but tides in the ocean. Let's think. Tides have to do with the waves and the movement of the water. And it's also the water level if it's high or low. So in the ocean, we have two high tides and two low tides a day, and it's connected to the moon. So the gravitational pull from the moon are what determines or depicts our tides. And like I said, we have two high tides and two low tides each day. Now, if we look at this picture, would you think this is high tide or low tide? Let's think. Think about the difference. If it's high tide, the water level is going to be really, really tall or really high. And if it's low tide, the water level is going to be really low. So if we take a look at a picture like this and there's all these exposed rocks and there's actually animals in this photo, would you think that's high tide or low tide? If you said low tide, you're right. So when it's low tide, the water recedes or it goes back and it exposes the rocks. And what happens is water gets caught in all those surfaces in the holes and crevices and spaces in those rocks. So the water gets caught there as the waves go back out. And there's animals that also get caught in those spaces as well. Now we're going to take a look at a video. I think we have a video of the changing tide. And so you're going to see how the tide rises and then how it goes lower and where the water gets caught in those spaces on those rocks. And that creates this habitat of a tide pool. So let's take a look at this video. So this video I'm gonna mention, it's a little bit blurry, but you'll get the idea. You'll be able to see how it changes, what is exposed when it's low tide and what is covered up at high tide. So we can see the water moving in here, goes a little faster, it's sped up. So the water level continues to rise covers up more and more of the beach and of the rocks. Did 
you all catch that? Did you see how that water was really far out and we could see all the sand and the rocks? And then as the tide came in, it covered up more and more and more of the beach until that beach was basically covered in water. And that happens in cycles. Two times a day, it'll be completely covered and two times a day, it'll be lower. Now we had a question come in already. Riley wants to know how big are tide pools? And as you can see from that picture and some of the other pictures we'll see as we go through this program, it really depends. The span of a tide pool can be a really long span. It can be the whole coastline. It can go on for maybe just a short, space or even miles and then each individual tide pool is going to be different sizes based on the rocks. So there could be some really big pools if a big rock space or boulder is carved out or it could be even small and you're going to find different animals and different life in those different size tide pools. There's also levels. So depending on how low or high the tide is, we'll have some upper level of rocks exposed or lower level and the lower levels are going to have larger pools than some of the higher levels and so it really just depends on where you're exploring the tide pool and what it looks like here's another video and you can see right here down at the bottom there are some bigger pools over here there's a bigger pool so these are farther out we're going to get some bigger tide pools so some can be large enough for even a person to walk into and some are going to be really small that only a little animal might live in now, the tide pools are one of my favorite habitats to explore for a lot of reasons, but one of those reasons is you can walk right out to tide pools. So I love exploring the ocean on a boat or going snorkeling or scuba diving. I'm scuba certified, but the beauty of exploring tide pools is you don't need any of that equipment. All you really need is a good pair of sturdy shoes and you can walk right out onto those rocks. You want to be careful, but it's really easy to explore and there's so much life living in the tide pools. So it's one of my favorite places to explore, but Let's think about it from the perspective of those animals who make the tide, whose tide pool, who the, make their home, sorry, in the tide pools. The tide pools are actually one of the toughest, most challenging places, places in the whole ocean to live. Now, it might not seem like that because it's so easy for us to access, but think about what challenges might an animal in the tide pool face? Now, we're going to talk about some of those problems right now, but if you think of any challenges that those animals might face, I want you to text them in and we'll make sure to cover all of those problems because there's a ton of challenges that these animals face. Now, I like to focus on the three Ps as far as challenges go, but there are way more, so send those in. And then after we cover those challenges, we're going to talk about some adaptations or some ways that these animals are able to survive given those challenges. Now, before we get into those challenges, we have another question. Marie wants to know, how does the moon make tides? Excellent question. So the moon has this gravitational pull that comes from that moon onto our planet, and that's what changes those tides. I don't know too much about the science behind it, but I know that it is determined by the moon. Uh, and maybe we'll get some more information and we can add that in, or you're welcome, you can look it up. Uh, but it is determined by the gravitational pull of the moon. All right, so let's think about those challenges. What makes living in the tide pool so difficult? So I said we, I like to talk about the three Ps. So the first one are predators. So think about if you are living in a tide pool, it's a small little area. You are stuck in that tide pool. Oh, here's a great picture of some animals in the tide pool. So these animals, they are stuck in that small little area with each other. Predators are a huge problem. Think about this sea star. There's a bunch of sea stars here. Here's a sea star. It's called an ochre star. And ochre stars are predatory animals. So they are looking to eat other things. Now, if the tide goes out and you're stuck in a pool with another sea star, and you are maybe a mussel clam, which is a sea star's favorite food, do you think that sea star is going to say, oh, you're having a rough day. You're stuck in this pool. I'll give you a pass today. Probably not. So that sea star is going to look to eat whatever it can find in its tide pool for its survival. So predators are a huge problem to animals in the tide pool. Tide pools can be pretty shallow, right? We can see all these animals. And even if they were covered in a small layer of water, we would still be able to see these animals. And so not only predators in the pool can be a problem, but think about a tide pool. Think about when you go to the beach. What other animals do you see besides animals in the water? Maybe if we were to look up when we're at the beach, what would you see flying above you? What do you think? Maybe a bird? Absolutely. There are lots of birds who live along the shore and they wait for low tide and they look for those animals. So there's going to be birds flying around and they are waiting for that opportunity for the tide to go down, for those animals to be almost exposed or easier to catch because there's only a thin layer of water there covering them. And that's when they'll go eat. Now we have some tide pools here along our coast. We also have raccoons and possums, and I've even seen some foxes 
at the tide pools. And so these animals, they all wait for that low tide and then they go down to the, those rocky areas and they'll hunt for their next meal in the tide pool. So predators can be a big problem in the tide pool. So that's one P. The next P that I like to talk about is pollution. Now think about it. We have uh, viewers watching from all over the world. Now think about it. if you don't live along the coast, can you still cause pollution that harms the ocean? Absolutely. A lot of our trash makes it to its, the ocean. Uh, pesticides or fertilizers that we use on our garden, those can all eventually make their way to the ocean. And in a lot of pool areas, there are drain pipes and all the water from the drains from the street go into those pipes and out into the ocean. Now, if it's just from the street normally, if it's rainwater, some leaves, that stuff just gets mixed into the ocean. It's not too harmful, but with all those chemicals and all that trash that we're just dumping on the street or throwing away in not proper places, that stuff's gonna make its way to the ocean and to the tide pools. Now think about these animals that are living in these small spaces and what happens if those small spaces get covered in trash? Do you think that's really healthy for those animals? Probably not. It's not very safe or healthy for these animals. So pollution is a huge problem for these animals. All right, and then I talked about three Ps. We have one more P that I like to talk about, a challenge for these animals. And that P, I would like to say I'm looking at a bunch of them right now. That's what I usually say in the classroom, but people, we can be a problem for these animals too. Now, like I said, the tide pool is one of my favorite places to go explore. It's so easy to walk out there and it's really fun. I get really excited and then I start running and then crunch, crunch, crunch. Uh-oh. What do you think happened if you get so excited and you just run out into the tide pools? You might squish some animals. So the tide pool is a really cool place to explore, but we need to make sure that we are being careful when we go explore this habitat, that we're not stepping on too many animals. We also want to make sure that we are taking care of those animals that we see. We don't want to take animals from the tide pool. We don't want to move them to a different pool. We want to make sure we're leaving them in their home. So those are three pieces. Those are some of the challenges. Those aren't all the challenges that these animals face, but those are some big challenges that these animals face in the tide pool. So let's take a look. We've got some questions before we talk about some of the specific animals in the tide pool. So Connor wants to know, what is the biggest animal that lives in a tide pool? Oh, and we got an answer written, and this is actually one of my favorite animals to find in the tide pool. So it really depends on the tide pool itself. I've seen some really large fish in tide pools, but one of the largest animals that we do find is called a black sea hare. Now, I don't know, Dana, if we have a picture of any kind of sea hare. A sea hare is a type of slug. We're going to try and work on getting a picture of a sea hare. Sea hares are some of my favorite. I like the really slimy, squishy animals. Now, this is a brown sea hare. So it doesn't look really big. These animals get maybe about this big, but black sea hares can get huge. The biggest one I've seen is probably about this big. And these are mollusks. So they're basically all slime. They're really gooey and slimy and squishy animals. And the black sea hares are even larger. Now something cool about the brown sea hares is these animals actually ink. And their ink is bright purple. Think of like hot purple. That is the color of their ink. And they'll ink as a defense mechanism. So if they get scared, if they think an animal is trying to eat them or something trying to take them from the tide pool, they will ink. And it gets all over and it's kind of sticky and gross and it goes all over. And that way, animals don't want to get mixed up in that ink. And so they leave the sea hare alone. Now, the black sea hares, the really big ones, they actually don't ink. They are much larger. And what's neat is a mollusk is an animal that has a hard shell and a soft body. But there's lots and lots of different types of mollusks. And a lot of mollusks over the years have actually lost their shell. They no longer need that shell for protection. Now, sea hares, they have a soft body. And right here are two sort of flaps on the animal. And in the black sea hares, you can actually reach your hand in between those two flaps and feel the remnant of their shell. They have a hard part inside their body. Gives them a little bit of structure and protection. And you can actually feel it in the black sea hares. So that's an excellent question about the largest animal that we find in the tide pool. We got to talk about some of my favorite animals in the tide pool. All right. Uh, lots of friends want to know, it's a uh, what do predators hunt in the tide pool? That's an excellent question. What are predators looking for in the tide pool? Well, they're pretty much looking for anything that they can eat. So it depends on who the predator is. If it's the sea, sea stars, they're gonna be looking for our mussels or other clams and animals for them to eat. What about an anemone? Let's take a look at a picture of a tide pool, some animals that we might find there. Yeah. 
So we're gonna bring up the same picture that we had before. So we've got the sea stars, which those predators, they are looking for clams or mussels. And then these things right here, right there. That is a sea anemone. Now we usually think of anemones having these big wavy tentacles and we'll pull up a picture later of what it looks like open. But this anemone is closed up. It's pulled all those tentacles in. It probably knew that the water level was going lower. And so it brought in some water in its body and it pulled in all its tentacles to stay safe. But that animal is another predator in the ocean. Those tentacles that it sticks out have stinging cells in them and they're gonna be catching fish. So small fish they find in the tide pool or small shrimp, or I've even seen one of those anemones eating a sea star. So they're gonna find any food they can. So predators in the tide pool, they're really gonna be eating whatever they can find. There may not be too many options. They may not know when the tide's gonna go out and there'll be more food. So we call them opportunistic feeders and they're gonna eat whatever they can find. All right, and we have another question of what animals live in the tide pool. So we just talked about two of the inhabitants, the sea stars and the anemones. Oh, and then the sea, uh, the sea hare. And then in this picture here, we've got some barnacles up at the top. These right here are called gooseneck barnacles. And we've got some other barnacles. So barnacles are a really interesting animal. They attach to a rock and then they have these little feathers that they stick up to allow them to feed. And we see them covering the rocks at tide pools. There are hundreds and hundreds of barnacles, both kinds of barnacles that we find at the tide pools. So these animals, they make their home on the rocks as well. And these are animals that are gonna be prey to a lot of our other animals, like those sea stars are gonna feed on them. Birds are likely gonna be feeding on them as well. So we find a lot of these around the rocks as well. Now let's think about, we talked about some of the challenges to living in the tide pools and some other challenges these animals might face are the waves. Think about those waves are crashing over those animals over and over and over again all day long. Now these animals that live in the tide pools, do you think they want to get knocked off the rocks and taken out into the open ocean? It's probably not very safe for them out there. So a lot of animals in the tide pool have an adaptation or a special tool on their body that help them hold onto the rocks really tight so that they won't get taken by those waves. So let's think about how might an animal hold onto the rocks really tight? How might they face that challenge of the waves? Do they have arms and legs like us? They can hold on really tight? I don't think these animals have arms and legs like us. And think about, we could hold onto a rock really tight, but if we're getting hit by waves over and over and over, we'll get pretty wet and cold. Our arms might get really tired. They might get scraped up and eventually we'd let go. But some of these animals in the tide pool, they have a really cool adaptation, a way for them to hold onto the rocks really tight. Let's take a look at a sea star. Do we have the picture of the bottom of a sea star? So think about a sea star. All right, some of our anemones also have these. Our sea hare had this as well. They have something sticky on their body that helps them hold on really tight to those rocks. Does anyone know what I'm trying to, what I'm talking about? What is so sticky? We have a picture of it right here along the arm. They're suction cups. Suction cups are these sticky feet on the sea star that help them hold onto the rocks really tight. So our sea stars have hundreds of feet with suction cups. Our sea hare had one suction cup on its belly. Our snails that we find in the tide pools also have a suction cup on their belly. There are even some anemones that suction up into a rock and then they can move around if they need to, but they'll hold on with that suction cup. So there's a lot of animals that have suction cups that they use to hold on really tight to the rocks. Now sea stars are a really cool animal that we find in the tide pools. And they use those suction cups not only to hold onto the rocks, but they use those suction cups for a lot of different things as well. So those suction cups help them stand to the rock, hold onto the rocks really tight, but it also helps them find their food. Now, how do you think their feet help them find their food? So they don't have a nose like we do, but they actually have cell, smell receptors on their feet and they can smell for their food using their feet. So when you see a sea star walking along with those suction cup feet, they're actually smelling for their food. Now, sea stars eat a range of things, but most sea stars in the tide pool like to eat mussel clams. And sea stars, they may not seem like the most fascinating animal, but these are really interesting animals. And they actually eat in a really weird way. Now, I do think about a mussel clam. Mussel clam is an animal with two shells. I don't know if we have a mussel clam shell. Let's see if we have one. I don't know if we have one. Anyways, we can make one with our hands. So if you take your hands, clap it together. This is your muscle clam. They're kind of have a long body. They have two shells and they'll open and close those shells and they'll stick out little hairs to catch their food. And they also have ropes, we call them bissel threads that help them 
stick onto a rock and hold on really tight. So that way, if a wave comes, they're not going to go anywhere. Now, a sea star, it's hungry. It's a predatory, as we talked about before, is looking for its food. It's going to crawl around, and it's actually smelling with its feet. So we're going to pull up a picture that's got some muscles in it so we can get an idea. All right, so we've got some barnacles, and then up. Uh, here we go. Here, we've got some muscles. So they've got those long shells, so the muscles are attached to the rock. And the sea star is going to smell for the muscle. And then the sea star, it's not even going to pull that muscle off the rock. What they're going to do is they're going to take their suction cups, which are all over their arms, and they're basically going to give the muscle clam a giant hug. Do you guys hug your food before you eat it? Sometimes we're so hungry, we might want to hug our food. But we don't really hug our food. But the sea star gives that muscle clam a giant hug, and then it pulls really hard until it pulls open that muscle clam shell just a little bit. It doesn't need it open all the way. It just needs it open a little bit. And then it's ready to eat. And it eats in a really weird way. So the way you guys had breakfast this morning, I'm sure you put the food in your mouth, you chew it up, you swallow it, and it goes to your stomach. That is not what my sea star does. What our sea stars do, once they get that muscle clam open just a little bit, is they're going to take their stomach, and they're actually going to pull it up out of their mouth. They're going to stuff it into that muscle clam. They're going to make a soup out of that muscle clam. There's acid on their stomach, just like there's acid in our stomach that breaks down our food. So they're going to break down that food, and then they're going to slurp that muscle clam back into their body. Pretty interesting, right? So this is, oh, here's a great photo. So here you can see not only their suction cup feet, all these little circles. I think if you see them in person, they kind of look like macaroni noodles. But they use those suction cup feet to hold on and then to help them get their food. So this is a mix of not only sea star food, but also their stomach. Their stomach kind of looks like a big balloon. All right, so we've talked a little bit about one of our predators in the tide pool, and we have a lot of questions coming in. So before moving on to some of our other tide pool animals, I'm going to take a look at some of these questions. So Greta said that one time she saw a seagull eating a sea star at the tide pool. Excellent, yeah. So seabirds, they're pretty much going to eat whatever they can find, especially seagulls. I bet we've all been to the beach or a park, and a seagull got into our picnic lunch and they were trying to eat whatever they could find and so if a sea star is what that sea seagull could find they're probably going to eat it mine wants to know what does a sea hairy Ooh, sea hairs that's an excellent question so sea hairs they eat something called sea lettuce now you heard that right it doesn't quite look like the lettuce that we eat but it is a bright green it's a type of algae and they will just munch on sea lettuce all day long they can just mow down a bed of sea lettuce so that is the main thing that they are eating excellent question all right, Caleb wants to know, do octopus ever get stuck in tide pools? Excellent question, Caleb. So it's not even that octopus get stuck in tide pools. Octopus live in tide pools. So we haven't mentioned this animal yet, but this is one of my favorite animals to talk about. So octopus, we do find them in tide pools because tide pools are small spaces. There's lots of rocks around. Oh, here's a little baby octopus. So it's a good place for an octopus to hide. Uh, and to stay safe in those little crevices of the rock. We'll find them in lots of places. We'll find them under rocks. We even find them sometimes in bottles and cans that we find at a tide pool. Because an octopus has no bones in its body. It's a very soft and squishy animal. And they can actually fit through any space the size of their beak. So even if the octopus is this big, if their beak is this big, they can fit through a space this size. And so they'll often squeeze their body into a bottle and hide there. Because do you think a lot of other animals can fit into the mouth of a bottle? Probably not. So it's a good place for an octopus to hide. So we definitely find octopus in our tide pools. And here along our coast, we find the two-spot octopus. We have a picture of a two-spot. They're going to bring it up. We'll figure out why we call it a two-spot octopus. In the meantime, we've got some more questions. Henry wants to know, what is the smallest animal in the tide pool? And the answer to that is plankton. So any tiny animal that floats through the ocean, we'll find that those animals out in the open ocean and in the tide pool because they're just drifters. So it's little tiny shrimp and krill and other little tiny planktonic animals that are just floating in the water. And they actually feed a lot of our animals in the tide pool. So we mentioned those barnacles and the mussels that stick up those hairs to feed. They're going to be eating all those tiny animals that drift through the water. So we actually need that plankton to be coming into the tide pools to feed those animals. All right, Lorelai wants to know why are mollusks so slimy? So we got a picture. This is another kind of mollusk. So octopus are another slimy animal. I like to think they're slimy because it's fun for us to play with. But that's not really why they're slimy. Let's think about why it might help an animal to be so slimy. Think about it. We feel slime, 
Is it easy to hold on to? Not really. It kind of slides right out of our hands. So think about it. if these animals have a layer of slime that covers their body, it might be easier for them to get away from predators. It's harder for an animal to hold on to something that's really slimy. It just slips right out of their mouth or maybe their claws. So octopus are really slimy and it helps them get away from predators. Same with sea hares and other snails. So that slime is a way of protection on their body. All right, so here is our two spot octopus that's found in the tide pool. Now this is really cool. Octopus are super cool animals. So first off, here's one spot. Did you think that was the eye? Kind of looks like it could be an eye, but the eye of the octopus is actually right here. And this is a spot. And there's another spot on the other side. So there are two spot octopus. Now, why do you think it might have a spot on its body that isn't its eye? Let's think about it. Could it be tricking another animal? Absolutely. So the octopus tricks other animals into confusing where its eye is. And that helps the octopus so they can spot things. They can be looking at a predator and the predator doesn't know where the octopus is looking. And that helps them get away from predators. Now, octopus, you can also notice in this picture, the octopus is doing a pretty good job of blending into its surroundings. So octopus have something called chromatophores. They're color changing cells all over their body and they allow the octopus to change color and to change texture. So octopus are masters at blending into their surroundings. So they can make their bodies whatever kind of brownish, greenish, reddish colors they find in the tide pool so that it's harder to find them. Now here's a really good video. I'm gonna step off so you can watch this octopus changing colors. Ooh, that's so cool. Who would have thought that octopus that was smooth and bright red would turn kind of yellowish and whitish and spiky. That's a really cool adaptation for an octopus is that they can not only change color, but texture to help blend into their surroundings. Now we have another question. An Aja wants to know, are sea urchins in tide pools? Absolutely. Sea urchins are found all over the tide pools. They are found in abundance in tide pools. Now you might be wondering what a sea urchin is. So we're gonna pull up a picture of a sea urchin. They are kind of like a spiky ball. They're purple. We also find red urchins in the tide pools and they play a really important role in our tide pool. So let's see if we can bring up a picture of a sea urchin. Excellent, here is our purple sea urchin. There's this really pretty purple color and the sea urchin is sitting right on top of a piece of kelp. So this is actually what they eat. Sea urchins love to eat kelp and they actually can mow down a kelp forest if there are too many urchins, but that is their main source of food. Now sea urchins, have these spikes for protection. So that is their adaptation. So a sea urchin that sits in a tide pool, you think if there's a lot of them, they might be a food source for other animals, but these spikes all over their body deter other animals from eating them because it's really spiky and it's harder to get to the meat on the inside of that animal. And so most animals won't want to eat this spiky ball right here. Now, the sea urchin I said is sitting on this piece of kelp and you might be wondering, where is its mouth, right? There doesn't look like there's too much to this animal, but their mouth is actually on the bottom. So it's underneath in the very middle and they only have five teeth. It's shaped like this. It's sort of uh, in a circle and it's called an Aristotle's, Aristotle's lantern. And that is what they use to munch on this kelp. Now, sea urchins are also known to burrow. So when you go to the tide pools, you might see them kind of wiggle their way in and sitting inside a rock. And they've created a nice little crater or a hole in which they sit in. And that just makes it even harder for animals to get them off of the rocks. Now, just like the sea stars and the octopus and the snails, sea urchins also use suction cups to hold on. And it's also how they walk along the tide pools. All right, we've got a couple more questions because we're about out of time. Um, all right, let's see what our questions are. Maya wants to know, how do sea stars push their stomach out of their body? That's an excellent question. They have muscles inside and they just use those muscles to push their stomach out. And so those muscles are pushing and contracting and it pushes that stomach out. The stomach doesn't detach from their body, it's still attached, but it kind of hangs out, looks kind of like a deflated balloon. And then they'll contract those muscles and pull it back into their body. Excellent question. All right. Ah, there's another question about their stomach. Are the sea stars hurt when they pull their stomach out of their body? It, as far as we know, it doesn't hurt their body because that's how they eat. 
So it wouldn't be really productive for an animal to be in pain every time it eats. So that is just a natural process for that sea star to push their stomach out of their body and then to pull it back in when they're eating. Excellent question. All right, Dana wants to know, ooh, what's the nutritional value of a sea star? And does it provide grit for their gizzard? Those are, yeah, those are excellent questions. You know what? I do not know the nutritional value of a sea star, but I would imagine not much. If we think about a sea star, and when you all get a chance to come visit us at the aquarium, you can take a look at their body. There's not a lot to their body. They have a stomach. They have what we call a water vascular system. So they have water that pumps through their body, but they don't have too many other organs in there. So I can't imagine that the nutritional value is very high or very good for animals. And so when animals eat sea stars, it's sort of like there's nothing else for them there to eat. They'll eat it as a last resort. Excellent question. Uh, how do octopus get so slimy? That is a great question. Clara asked, how do octopus get so slimy? Their body produces that slime. We actually find slime on a lot of animals in the ocean, even fish. Fish can have a layer of slime on their body, and their body is able to produce that slime. And just like it protects the octopus, makes it harder to grab a hold of that animal, it protects the fish as well. All right, everyone, we are out of time. I loved having all your questions and talking about the tide pool. I hope sometime soon you'll be able to come visit us at the aquarium or you'll even get to go visit a tide pool on your own and explore all these animals. So we're so glad that you joined us today. If you have more questions, feel free to email us at live at lbaop.org and we'll answer your questions there. And I hope you'll tune in to another uh, program with us later today for our online academy. And we're going to leave you with this beautiful picture of a tide pool at sunset. Thanks, everyone.